Um, uh, he's uh, uh, Professor Frank uh, Lee uh, from um, Hong Kong Polytech, Department of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Okay, uh, good afternoon. So today, I uh, try to share with you some uh, indoor air quality uh, measurement and uh, try to share with some of the past experience that we have uh, here uh, uh, for the various uh, field study. Uh, so it's uh, 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 the, 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 uh, Hugo actually gave me a lot of tough uh, question in order to uh, try to address uh, this uh, uh, topic, but uh, it's not easy, so I try to do my best. So uh, uh, first, I will try to review the current uh, IQ guideline uh, under different uh, regions or different countries. Uh, 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 for different pollutants, you know, focus on formaldehyde, NO2, PM, and uh, even other pollutants. And uh, try to evaluate different measurement protocol. You know, we, we will use Hong Kong as an example to show you what the big uh, uh, variations uh, currently, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, under this uh, uh, scenario. And uh, at the end, I'll share with you some uh, uh, IQ's uh, field study. Uh, this time I choose uh, cooking. I choose uh, uh, two museum study in Xi'an. Uh, one is Terracotta Museum, uh, which is kind of famous. But uh, also the, the new museum, which is Han Yanglin, also in Xi'an, with modern type of uh, uh, control technology. And uh, uh, I will try to show you, you know, what's the, the contrast uh, for the, the older museum and the new museum from IQ uh, uh, point of view. And uh, the third part uh, I will try to share with you uh, is the, the indoor chemistry. Because a lot of indoor chemistry actually happens same as outdoor. I, I'm sure outdoor SOA, secondary organic aerosol happens and uh, from our study, or even from a lot of study, you know, this indoor chemistry study do exist. Uh, you know, uh, BVOC reactor with so, uh, ozone, which is pr typical present in indoor environment, under room temperature. So uh, the, 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 the study that we'll try to show you is uh, some chamber study, which uh, uh, show you the, 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 the floor cleaner, the, the, the detergent that you use, the typical use in the household. Uh, do create the secondary organic chemistry. And, uh, and uh, then I'll show you some uh, tempo study, you know, uh, focused on formaldehyde uh, em emissions. Okay. So this is uh, easy, you know, show you how IQ is important, you know. With, uh, uh, without air, then uh, in several minutes you're going to die. And uh, even in critical mass, you know, 10 kg. But uh, it's not easy to, to measure it correct uh, because uh, based on so many variables and uh, also QAQC standard detection limit, you know, passive sampling versus uh, 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 real-time me measurement in, exp in expensive sampler versus uh, expensive sampler, you know. So uh, also there are so many pollutants, so many sources, you know, not just household. Uh, uh, tobacco smoking, VOC, you know, formula high. So there are so many uh, 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 variables available. So you get to decide you know, which per pollutant or which uh, uh, IQ pollutant is the target. So uh, even in terms of uh, IQ guideline, you know, this is a busy slide. I don't expect you to read. But the, what I'm trying to show you is uh, there are so many organi organizations internationally or even locally you know, city-based or country-based, uh, they try to set up a IQ guideline. And uh, uh, some IQ guidelines focus on uh, uh, long-term average, like uh, 24 hour, sometimes uh, eight hour. And uh, some uh, guidelines actually move, starting to move to short-term uh, short average, uh, such as one hour, such as uh, 15 minutes. So later, during our review, we will also try to highlight you know, what's the impact of uh, this, uh, you know, time average moving from 24 hour to uh, eight hour to one hour, even to short, short uh, uh, 
exposure. So this is the slide that uh, I have several slides repeating similar. So this is the, the first slide that I show you. Huh? So uh, formula high exposure. So you can easily see, you know, some uh, exposure guideline criteria were list here, uh, uh, and the different averaging time. You know, some of them is, uh, say, for example, Australia eight hour regular at 200 microgram uh, per cubic meter. And uh, uh, WHO also have a suggest guideline, but they uh, suggest the half an hour uh, uh, guidelines. So, uh, so uh, in other, or even in terms of concentration, uh, Hong Kong uh, here we, we do have a two uh, IQ guideline for formula high. The good class, uh, which is easy to achieve, uh, it's a uh, 100. But we have a very uh, stringent guideline, which is uh, for excellent class, which is regular at the 30. So this 30 uh, myogram per cubic meter uh, formula that is really tough to meet. So uh, this uh, later I will also share with you how you can do this. So, uh, so in other words, you can see different uh, 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 IQ guidelines actually have a different concentration level or even different averaging time. So it's, it's not easy to compare, you know, in a, in a, even you have uh, so many uh, da uh, data. Uh, NO2 is another example. You know, some, uh, 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 some uh, WHO actually have a, have a new uh, NO2 for one hour, which is 200, okay? And uh, uh, in most of the uh, 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 guidelines here, actually, the, the guidelines are higher than this uh, WHO guideline in terms of one hour. Even some of the guidelines, you know, is regular at 24 hour. So you might ask, uh, is it reasonable to look at the 24 hour or one hour, or even shorter, you know. For a place uh, su uh, such as a uh, household in, uh, indoor, such, or even for a place in classroom, or even for bus terminal, uh, is, it, uh, is it better to look at the short-term exposure, say one hour or 15, uh, 15 minutes, uh, in order to justify how good is your, is your air quality. So uh, uh, ozone is also an example, similar to previously, you can find out, you know, uh, eight hour, one hour, or even uh, uh, Australia have a, like four hour standard, which is uh, 160. And uh, Hong Kong, you know, we have excellent class uh, ozone at uh, uh, below fi uh, 50. So uh, again, this is all huge variation. PM, same thing, you know, different, uh, uh, a lot of PM standard in indoor actually is uh, just an automatic transfer from outdoor standard to indoor standard. But it turned out, uh, say for example in Hong Kong, we do have an excellent class, uh, and this is 20, you know, very difficult to meet in order to attract people to do more things in order to meet this 20. So, uh, so this is the way, the, you know, these two level standards actually is a, is a good way to, to extract uh, people to achieve more uh, uh, cleaning. And uh, even maybe you are in good class, uh, two or three years later, under certain upgrade, you might have a chance to move to excellent class. So uh, PM 2.5, surprisingly, you see a lot of indoor standards is missing. You know, maybe due to the outdoor standard, it's kind of lacking far behind. So, uh, so this is the case uh, uh, where uh, we tried based on the first part. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the different loca sampling location, some uh, uh, specify, some do not specify. How frequently you do the management, uh, even the period, uh, eight hour, one hour, four hour, you know, it's all very. Most of the protocol lists out criteria of a monitoring location, for example, you know, even in Hong Kong, we, we set by. Even outdoor, you, you get to do monitoring, and there's some uh, guidelines do have a, a certification uh, request that close to the fresh air intake for, or even an air handling unit. You know, and for indoor air monitoring location, distance from the wall, there are some specification, ventilation device, local sources, all these, you know, has been specified. And uh, so uh, sh short term versus long term also have a different variation. For example, uh, uh, Korea, China actually do specify for the one hour, but the UK actually specify for 30 minutes uh, formula time. So you can see the variation, even under same uh, indoor air uh, 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 criteria. And uh, so, uh, so in other words, from exposure point of view, short term versus long term is always, always uh, good, right? But the, in the field study, it's difficult. Why? Because uh, limited resources, uh, limited equipment, and uh, even limited budget. So it's not easy to get the, the really worst case. 
you know. Uh, it, it, so this is the, 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 the problem that they're always existing because you always have the limited uh, uh, time and the limited uh, uh, budget. And the how you can really justify the measurement data that you got uh, is really good. You know, that's, uh, that's difficult. So this is why uh, the, the short term versus the, uh, the clinical exposure reflect on the IQ sampling is also a, a big issue. This is the table that I show you. Uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, IQ, we have the uh, IQ objective, IQ guideline. It's not compulsory, but it's a suggest guideline whether, whether uh, uh, we, we put it. So you can see, for example, NO2 uh, for excellent level, eight hour average is 40. Formula high is 30 milligram per kilo. So this is the top pollutant, which is to meet, you know, it's got 30. Even uh, PM10, 20, you know, this 20 is not easy to meet. So, so far in Hong Kong, there are more than uh, 184 buildings uh, has, has been got the, the excellent class uh, certification. And uh, there are more than uh, 750 building or indoor location got the good class. So in other words, this is the way, try to push a good uh, air quality in order to uh, let the, the indoor owner to, to have uh, better uh, things. So uh, under this IQ guideline, this is also an example. You got to have a minimum number of sampling. You know, otherwise, how did you, for a big, big, large building, how many sample points you got to collect uh, and how you do the averaging in order to get the maximum or, or, or the averaging. So uh, this is all the requests. Uh, and so we review some of the IQ guidelines. They, they uh, some do, some don't. So you have a huge variation. So everybody know, you know, this is the textbook types. Uh, factor affecting IQ, so many factor, outdoor, indoor, you know. And all this actually will contribute to the variation to the, to the IQ measurement. And uh, so this is why when you design uh, IQ sampling protocol, you got to consider all the factor, all the potential variation, potential uh, impact. For example, this uh, building maintenance and the cleaning habit, you know, what kind of indoor solvent you use, uh, which will, uh, which will uh, or even floor cleaner that you use, it might have an uh, impact. Okay, so these are all the questions that you can ask. Pollutant level, diurnal variation, weekly variation, you know, easily. You, then you got to decide what, how you, what kind of uh, IQ sampling strategy that you are going to carry out in order to, uh, to consider them all. So a lot of equipment actually is available. Some of them is passive, you know, such as uh, this uh, passive sampler. Some of them is real time. For example, carbonia, you know, DMPH uh, sampling uh, could be uh, followed with HPLC analysis could be good. But uh, uh, later I'll show you uh, recently we, we kind of, we're using PDIMS uh, to scan the, the, company, uh, the, the real time ca uh, carbonia species, which turned out is great. So a lot of poten uh, potential equipment actually uh, has been used in outdoor environment. Can can also be shared or can be used to switch to indoor environment. You know, this is the potential that, uh, 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 that we find. You know, this is the, the PDIMS system. Uh, the, they have a lot of uh, uh, advantage, uh, but uh, uh, to make it short, uh, fast response and the real time. And the simultaneous, what you can scan. You got all the carbonia species, you know, uh, formaldehyde, acetylene aldehyde, or even acetone, you know, the T3 uh, carbon species, or even you got the, the toluene and the benzene, it's, and it's all in very low level. So this is the way that we find the potential, you know, try to move from, from a, a, a passive to real time, but I'm sure this is expensive, it's not, not all the lab can do it, but there's a potential where you can, uh, using uh, advanced equipment in order to get the more uh, uh, data. Okay, so in Hong Kong, actually, uh, there are a lot of uh, field study. You know, in the past, uh, we did the uh, restaurant, uh, office, uh, residential, uh, we even do the aircraft uh, study, uh, uh, where uh, show, uh, cover uh, long haul, short haul, you know, and identify. Uh, even traditional market, uh, you know, uh, air conditioning versus without air conditioning. So all this data, actually, can be uh, 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 trigger out uh, a lot of IQ problems do exist uh, under different uh, IQ microenvironment. So this is the, the, the shot that we, we collect uh, uh, IQ in the residential and the, even in some uh, commercial uh, 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 cooking restaurant. 
So we use uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, mid valve uh, uh, flow, and we collect all the uh, species, pH, VOC, carbonia, PM2.5, which detail chemical speciation. So, you know, so we collect a lot of uh, source profile locally in Hong Kong for different uh, emission purpose. And uh, uh, this is uh, the data that we collect. So surprisingly, we, we, we figure out uh, uh, the data. Uh, commercial restaurants actually do have uh, more emissions compared with residential. You know, uh, and uh, uh, especially uh, carbonia species, you know, and uh, even pH, gas phase, and particle phase. Uh, so uh, uh, what we find out is uh, Chinese cooking, because uh, more oil, more stir fry, so, you know, so they have a lot of uh, organic base, the VOC. Also, the fatty acid uh, is more, you know, compared with other. But the PM, uh, West Restaurant actually have, have uh, uh, less PM 2.5. The total cooking mass, the PM and the TVOC, compared with the total emission in Hong Kong, is less than 10%. So in other words, the total emission from cooking, uh, including uh, commercial and residential, is not that much. It's not significant, I would say. So uh, uh, we also did the several uh, study focused on cooking. Uh, this study is uh, it's interesting. Uh, it tried to look at the, the emission from different cooking process, also different cooking oil and also different cooking fuel. So eventually you get these three uh, uh, emissions together and try to look at that. Uh, you know, these are typical uh, cooking oil that we use in Hong Kong. You know, corn oil, peanut oil, rib seed oil, carbon oil, or even all, all, uh, and so different oil actually have a different uh, burning point, uh, which is leading to different emissions. So busy slide, but the, what they show is uh, these are three uh, uh, components, cooking fuel, cooking oil, and the food. And what's the pollutant uh, emission out of 100? So you can see uh, cooking fuel, actually, it's more NO2, NO, uh, NO and NO2, and even PM, majority. Cooking oil is, is less. How about food process, you know? Uh, food process uh, actually do have uh, more uh, uh, PM, you know? depending on different cooking process. And how about cooking oil? Cooking oil turned out have a more aldehyde, especially the acetylene aldehyde. So in other words, this is a three 100% uh, 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 chart. Uh, turned out cooking fuel is also uh, leading position, but the cooking oil and also cooking processes could also leading to different cooking emission. So in general, uh, you know, the, the fuel contribution, some of the pollutants is very little. Some of the pollutant actually is high. Uh, we also did the several museum uh, study in China. This is two of them. Uh, the Terracotta Museum is uh, very famous. Uh, uh, it's located in Xi'an, and uh, it uh, looks like a, a football stadium type of museum. Huge, and uh, natural ventilation, no, uh, uh, no mechanical ventilation. Then uh, uh, the, they are number one, uh, uh, the most popular museum uh, in China. So uh, uh, what happened is uh, uh, this, uh, due to the recent development, Xi'an is also highly polluted. So outdoor PM from power plant, from vehicle, also penetrated to this museum. And uh, uh, so we, we got involved and tried to look at the, what's going on with the indoor sampling. So also we look at the, what's the tourist impact, uh, you know. Tourists also bring outdoor dust, uh, bring different uh, 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 impact, uh, you know, rainy season, humidity, dry dust, uh, all that, you know. So uh, eventually what happened is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the shining warrior, which originally you can see, you know, very presentable. But the, after so many years, you know, this is what's uh, going on. So we expect a lot of, uh, you know, the physical or chemical weathering happen on this uh, service. And the why? Because the organic aerosol, PM or even sulfate nitrate, you know, do oxidize uh, on the surface. So we do, do a lot of a study on this, uh, uh, collect the, the filter, uh, got the, all the micro chamber study in order to evaluate the different corrosive gas, ozone, uh, uh, the ammonia, uh, NO2, SO2, that kind of things, you know. And uh, we figure out the, the, the PM10, actually PM2.5 is also very high, more than 70, 60% PM uh, out of TSP. And the indoor PM uh, in this uh, museum, the majority actually is organic carbon, you know, organic carbon, and also a high sulfate. 
you know, uh, high sulfate, uh, which is corrosive gas, uh, do uh, cause the impact. So this, uh, this one is a new one. If you don't, if you go to Xi'an, next time you remember you read uh, this one. This one you can see uh, based on the experience uh, uh, of the museum. So what they do, they try to isolate uh, so they don't dig out. All the warrior under, is underneath uh, or, or even in the enclosed uh, system where no outdoor air, dirty air will be exposed, which in some way is good to, to corrode all these problems, right? So this is all the, all the system, you know, fancy modern design. Then uh, uh, you can see they still have a mini type of warrior, not as big as that. And uh, what happened is that they have a different challenging. This is the wide crystal on surface which they find, you know. And uh, you might ask why. So we got involved and uh, we do also similar things. And uh, we find out a lot of soluble salt. You know, even it's enclosure, no tourist impact, uh, no outdoor uh, emission. But the underground water fluctuation, you know, all the, all the uh, gas, uh, off gas from the underground water do have a different impact to this museum. So again, you know, these are the things that, that, that you look at the uh, different IQ uh, location and you try to dig out what's the impact of different IQ problem in order to evaluate. Uh, this is the, 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 the SOA pollution based on uh, one of my PhD, uh, past PhD students. So uh, the concept is a lot of people are also focused on the primary VOC, including BVOC, and the oxidized with ozone, with the OH, with other oxygen. And this will create the secondary uh, organic aerosol and also induce the, sec uh, the secondary uh, 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 ultrafine particle. So uh, what we did is uh, we do the, the, to the local air cleaning product, which is typically you, you, you check every household. They do have this kind of, no matter it's the dishwasher, detergent, kitchen cleaning, or even floor cleaning. And they have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 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 VOC inside, which will uh, oxidize, uh, of gas or oxidize with ozone. Busy slide, but the uh, idea is we compare or ammonia impact with, uh, with uh, all these uh, 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 secondary reaction. I don't expect you to read, but the, what do we find is that uh, the, this uh, uh, indoor SOA do uh, uh, exist, uh, uh, initiate the ozone reaction with the delimiting. The delimiting actually is a lot of double bond which happened in this uh, detergent. And the presence of ammonia do enhance the yield of SOA, reduce the for formation of H2O2, and also the formation of ROH, you know, two, two uh, key species will trigger the reaction. So, uh, so in other words, all this uh, 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 indoor SOA is uh, it's an uh, 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 interesting topic uh, where for students or for people who want to study indoor chemistry. Uh, you come to Hong Kong, you know, this is the, the, the famous temple. So uh, this temple uh, also have a different IQ challenging, you know, both indoor and outdoor. And the why? Because uh, during Five peak minutes. season, a uh, lot of emissions, you know. So all these actually do uh, emit that. And what we find is formaldehyde, you know, busy slide, but formaldehyde, 150 uh, peak hour, 390, compared with the typical outdoor, uh, typical roadside, 4.7. And even the IO ratio is uh, always bigger than one. So this is the impact of uh, carbonia species in different uh, uh, studies. So uh, developing countries. So recent several years, we also moving our uh, air quality study to uh, Colombo, to, uh, to Nepal, even to uh, uh, Indonesia. We starting try to do a lot of indoor and outdoor uh, study in classroom, in the bus uh, uh, environment. So this is the study that we currently uh, ca carry on. We do a lot of uh, 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 lung function tests uh, with uh, this, and, uh, uh, and uh, also do a lot of a survey, first in Hong Kong and uh, tra transfer to different cities. Uh, at the end, we also show you, you know, this uh, bus, uh, bus terminal. A lot of bus are very busy, you know, some uh, located in underground or semi-indoor uh, environment. Uh, sorry. In Hong Kong, we do have a standard. So the standard is a CO, one hour, five minutes. So it's, a, it's not bad. But uh, this NO2 previous standard is 300 microgram per cubic meter. But the, uh, remember, due to the newly imposed uh, NO2 standard set up by WHO, this standard will change from 300 to 200, which is even more tough, more tough uh, for short-term uh, one-hour uh, 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 NO2 to meet. 
So this is why uh, we could, uh, in recent months, we are trying to, uh, to check uh, the, 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 the bus terminal and the how, see how good is uh, this uh, NO2 level. And uh, uh, it's not easy because a lot of bus, uh, you know, especially in the summertime, the bus with air conditioning and the engine is always on when they are wait, wait for the people uh, loading and unloading. And uh, uh, turned out it's not, it's not easy to meet uh, this uh, 200 for one hour. So uh, to, in order to make it short, uh, I will say uh, field mo uh, monitoring provides integrated assessment. You really need to have a solid data to identify what's go, what's go wrong. You know, the example that I show you for museum, for indoor air chemistry, or even for the, for the bus station, you know, do, have a, do pose a, a lot of challenging. Then uh, what do you need? Uh, you need to think carefully and you have a, a, a target to design and to get the worst case done. Because the, the way that, the, while you do management, you really want to get solid data to justify the, the problem. So uh, what I put here is uh, short term versus the long term. You know, as I mentioned, not easy. And it do exist a lot of variations uh, for, uh, for worst case for clinical exposure. And uh, indoor air chemistry actually is a hot topic and uh, it's, a, it's a, a lot of uh, people are trying to do the measurement. So uh, at the end, I show, show you this uh, uh, slides. This slide actually is interesting. I always show a uh, student when, when they are sleeping in the class, you know. This is what we call the roof, roof uh, uh, top uh, classroom. You know, back to old, old times, uh, Hong Kong uh, do not have enough space. So the, the classroom is on the rooftop, okay? And what happens, you can see all the students still, you know, work hard, nobody sleep. And this is outdoor, IO ratio is one, right? And the no, uh, no, no problem. The only problem probably is hot summer temperature is too hot. Or maybe during rainy, I don't know how can they survive. Right, so even this poor teacher is very difficult. But the, what, what the happened is from IQ management point of view, if you look at the back to the old classroom compared with the, the classroom that we have now, you know, most of the classroom in Hong Kong is air conditioning, very comfortable in terms of temperature, but you do find a lot of problems, high CO2, high mo, you know, other problems. So if you look at back, from IQ management point of view, this, this classroom could be good, right? Why? First, uh, nobody sleep, uh, except the teacher is very difficult, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't know how they can survive if it's raining. But uh, uh, this is the, the way that I share with you. IQ management is not difficult, but uh, it's the way that how we rethink and they make it simple and they solve all the problems. So at the end, uh, I will thank you all the uh, people who uh, either is funding agent or even some uh, 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 other uh, 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 supporting uh, organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very comprehensive, covering uh, lots of uh, areas that apparently your group are doing lots of uh, interesting work. So let's move on to uh, next uh, lecture, uh, which will be given by Professor Xu Dong Yang from uh, Tsinghua University, uh, Beijing. Good morning. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to focus on uh, is the uh, field study and uh, in human environmental in interaction in the uh, aircraft cabins. And, and I'm not going to give a comprehensive literary review. Rather, I'm going to report the uh, results that I've been doing in the past couple of years. Uh, so here is the outline of my talk. Uh, first of all, I will just give a very brief introduction about the aircraft cabin environment. And then we want to set up the goal for research and talk about the challenges. Uh, on the result, we will focus on two kinds of uh, uh, air pollutants in the aircraft cabin, and these are the volatile organic compounds and their sources, and also talk about the particles and their sources. And uh, finally, we want to come up with uh, some conclusions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to use this picture to illustrate how does the cabin environmental system work. 
Uh, the outdoor air, first of all, the outdoor air goes to the engine and is compressed there. And a portion of that will go to the combustion chamber to create the power. And another portion uh, will come to the uh, cabin to become the ventilation air. So we call this part, sometimes call this bleed air. And uh, before the air is supplied to the chamber, it has to go through a ozone converter to remove most of the ozone from the outside. And then go to the air conditioning pack to uh, generate the uh, desired temperature and pressure. And at this mixing point, uh, some part of the recirculated air will mix with the bleed air, and then they go to the uh, cabin, cabin through the air distribution duct. And I'll, I have to mention that before the recirculated air is supplied to the mixing point, it has to be filtered out through, usually through the HEPA, the high efficiency air filter. However, the bleed air only goes through the ozone converter, but no particle filtration is used in this channel. So that may have some con con consequence, as I'm going to show you in our later results. Uh, similar to many other indoor environments, we should certainly care about the comfort and uh, the safety in the cabin. Uh, when we talk about the cabin, really, aircraft, really, we know it's a special built environment, and also we know safety should always come to the top on the priority list. So for example, the pressure control is extremely important. The bleed air has to be clean, so that's always more important than the health and the comfort. And also, the energy consumption is highly related to the ventilation that I just showed you. Uh, because you cannot just simply open the window to get outdoor air. The ventilation in the aircraft cabin is very expensive. So keep that in mind. So we look at the safety issues. What are the safety issues? Uh, as I mentioned, the pressure control is very important. But it goes through an independent control. And talk about the contaminants. So we have the so-called abnormal contaminants, which are more related to the cabin safety, the accidents or incidents. And the abnormal contaminant does not really happen under normal conditions. So only when you are having the engine oil leak or whatever, and then they pollute the bleed air, and then that can cause a problem. So this is a serious incident or could be accident. So that's one part of the story. Meanwhile, we are looking at comfort and health-related issues. And these are more dealing with the so-called normal contaminants. And these are the, what I'm going to talk about, uh, focus on in my lecture. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, when you do the survey in the aircraft cabin, you may hear many, many complaints. And you can call those comfort complaints. And I have to say that these complaints may have many, many reasons. So I, I suggest this here. So pollutants could be one reason, but not all. So you have to look at many, many others. But in this talk, I'm only going to focus on the contaminants, not the others, because that will just single out our question. Uh, if you look at the uh, news media, uh, the, Many, many medium can actually report the incidents or accidents that are related to cabin air quality. Uh, however, different sources really give you uh, different numbers. Uh, and uh, it's not a surprise. For example, FAA and the Flight Attendant Union, they have a different views. And so they, they have different ways of counting these uh, accidents or incidents. There's a very important issue that we have to deal with in the aircraft cabin, and that is the infectious disease transmission. Because the cabin is really a highly dense environment with people sit uh, next to next. So if there is somebody who gets cold or who has a communicable infectious disease, that could be easily transmitted 
through the cadmium. So that's one part of the story, but, but that's not, not all. The other thing we also should keep in mind is the aircraft is a fast transporting vehicle. So it can transport the patients from one location to another very easily. So that's another thing, okay? So it could really cause fast worldwide epidemic. So that's another possibility. So based on the, this background information, uh, we have set up our research goals like these. Uh, and uh, basically we are looking at the mechanisms of the pollutants and where they come from and where do they go. Okay, so the pollutant sources and sinks. So we look at many different kinds of pollutants here. Meanwhile, uh, the inside of the cabin, uh, although there are uh, ozone converters being installed, but there is still a certain amount of ozone there. So that could incur the chemical reaction in the cabin. So that's another thing we need to look at. And also we want to develop some kind of simulation models trying to understand or to simulate the whole process. So that's another part of the work. Well, you can say to do the work, to do the, this kind of research in the aircraft cabin, you can say there should be a lot of challenges. And uh, I, I think the most important challenge that we foresee, actually we experience, is really how to get reliable and sufficient data. So this is similar to any other kind of field measurement. So you need to get the data accurate and sufficient to understand what's going on. So many people ask me, what's the difference between the field measurement in the cabin and in the building? Well, <laughs> I think uh, there are obvious reason, uh, uh, differences. Uh, first of all, we know buildings do not fly, right? So that's an obvious reason. Secondly, I think uh, we, uh, we know the building really is a very dynamic process, okay? So it's, 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 it's nothing like a steady state. So you have to deal with a very dynamic situation. And also, there is one more thing I think it should not neglect, okay? You don't need to buy a very expensive ticket to get in a building to do the measurement, but you do need that to get into aircraft. So next I'm going to talk about the VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, the VOCs actually, uh, there have been a lot of talk in this, in this uh, uh, in the air conference, so I'm not going to give a very basic information. So you can find that when you are sitting inside of the aircraft cabin, you look around, you can easily identify some of these VOC sources. For example, the materials, the carpet, the seats, they generate VOCs, and ourselves, the passengers, also generate VOCs. The services like the food, drink, and also cleaning agent, air freshener, okay, and also the ventilation system itself could bring in some kind of pollutants. And finally, as I just mentioned, there is chemical reaction happening inside the cabin. So the chemical reaction could also generate the VOCs. So you are really looking at a complex volume with a lot of different pollutant sources of VOCs. So since 2010, we have conducted more than 130 flights. We did this on board measurements. So it, here it shows that this, me this measurement really cover majority of the large aircraft, aircraft types, including the, all the Airbus and the, uh, most of the Boeing aircraft. And in terms of the flight duration, most of them are within two to three, one to three hours. However, we do have some quite 12%, which is about five, uh, 15 flights, which are international flights, 10 hours or longer. Again, as I mentioned, the flights uh, are dynamic, so we need to look at their operating phases. So before takeoff, and, and also during the cruise, before meal service or after meal service, and then during the landing. So all these processes may have a different uh, pollutant uh, concentrations. So we need to keep that in mind when we do the sampling. 
Well, uh, there's a very significant restriction for doing field measurements uh, on the aircraft cabin, and that is you cannot really bring in large equipment, instruments, because you have to go through the security check. And the instrument that you bring in should not have a power connection, so there's a lot of restriction. And we know for doing air sampling, we will see air sampling, the best way will be to, to use a sampling pump. Uh, but this is very not, not very convenient in aircraft. So we develop a so-called manual method, simpler, and what you need is only a medical syringe, a plastic syringe actually, and then you use a manual uh, to, to do the air sampling manually, and then we get the uh, compounds absorbed on this sampling tube, and then we bring the tube to the laboratory and go through the GCMS, and then we get the compounds identified. So that's the uh, that's a method that we use, and you can find that when this person is doing the sampling, it's hardly noticeable. So it's really not going to disturb any other people. Well, we got a lot of results, and uh, I'm not going to show you all of that. Uh, basically, you need to look at the quantitative result and the uh, qualitative and the quantitatively. Quantitatively really tells how many pollutants how many VOCs are there in the cabin. And it won't be surprise you if I say you can find a couple hundred VOCs in the cabin. That's normal in buildings as well. However, other than that, we really need to look at what are these pollutants? What are they? Okay, and also what are the range of concentration? And these are important issues. So based on a lot of analysis, we came up with this so-called VOC target list in the aircraft cabin. And uh, the criteria, in order to be listed here, the criteria is it should have either possible health risk, possible chemical reactant or bioaffluence, or possible odors or other discomfort. And also it should have a high, relatively high detection rate. And uh, so here it gives the concentration, the average concentration, and also the range of the variation. So this could be used as a reference if you are studying aircraft cabin, this could be used as a reference. So we had already published the results in this, in this paper in the building environment in very recently. Having that data, and then the next question we want to ask is where do these VOCs come from, right? So that's a difficult question in fact because you are measuring the cabin VOCs and then you're not measuring all the sources. So how do I know which source emits what? So that's another difficult question. So we kind of use a mathematical model trying to understand whether or not we could come up with some source identification or so-called source apportionment. So the, the model actually based on the measurement data and then you reduce the dimension through the mathematical process and then we came up, kind of came up with a total of eight factors. And of course, we need some no other knowledge. So came up with these factors, and these factors might be the potential sources. So that's the procedure. And here I just show you the results. And uh, this is only for total VOC, okay? For single VOCs, the result could be totally different. So for the total VOC, we came up, came up with these eight different factors. And if you look at the list, the top one actually is from the passengers, okay? Around 30% of the total VOC come from the people. Second one is a chemical reaction, which contributes roughly 15%, okay? So that really reminds us we need to pay more attention on the emissions from ourselves, from humans, okay? So human can emit directly through breeze, through skin, and also can emit indirectly through chemical reaction with ozone in the cabin. So we set up two different studies in order to understand this better. So first of all, I'd like to talk about VOC emissions from humans. Let's look a little bit of the history. We know that in 1800s, Pekin Hofer used uh, actually pay attention on this, that mentioned that human could be a polluted source. However, we only use CO2 as an indicator because of limitation of the measurements at that time. 
And then Professor Fanger proposed a concept called OS. And this is a co very qualitative concept. It just tells roughly, well, one OF means the chemical emission or, or the order of emissions from one standard person. So that's his definition. So it's a quantitative, it's qualitative rather than quantitative. Well, for further indoor air quality design and analysis, we really need quantitative data. So that's why we need more measurements to quantitatively understand what chemicals are emitted from ourselves. So that's the goal. And then we uh, try to separate this into two parts. First of all, we look at the easy part, which is the emissions from the breath, human breath. So we need to develop a kind of system and to get the air from out of our breath and then bring that into the lab and then we can get the, the chemical analysis results. So you can do the sampling in the laboratory, which is very easy, or you can also do that in, on the aircraft cabin. That's also very easy. So that these two pictures shows how to do that. Uh, and so we got a lot of results. Again, because of time constraint, I cannot go through all of that. But what I can say is certainly our breath also contain a lot of VOCs, and uh, there are a lot of things in common, but they are also very much different between, between people to, between person to person. So uh, we are trying to come up with something, you know, that could be used as a database when we have a much larger number of, uh, of the subjects in our, in our measurements. Also, I have to, uh, I think this is also a very interesting result. Uh, we know people could be sources of pollutants, okay? And uh, so this is, uh, shows that the uh, acetone emissions from our cells. And uh, it's actually related to the ambient condition. If the ambient condition, or even environmental condition is different, then the emission rate is different, okay? So this is, now, for this kind of pollutant, benzene, for example, if the ambient concentration is higher, then at a point, we may change from a source into thing. And this also happens to some other pollutants, okay? So that's the interesting evidence. If people are a thing, that really means you are taking pollutants from the environment rather than generating. So that's the, uh, that may have a profound uh, impact to the exposure, okay? So this is the very in interesting and direct evidence to show that people can absorb uh, VOCs from the environment. And also we are trying to understand uh, how the other influencing factors may affect the VOC emission from our breath. So we look at several issues, for example, the gender, okay? Male or female, the gender, and also we look at the uh, ages, okay? That could be important. We look at the metabolic rate and also smoker or non-smoker. So these factors, we actually have done a lot of comparisons and we came up with both qualitative and quantitative analysis. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't published the results, so uh, I don't have much to say here, uh, but uh, there are some very, very general questions or uh, uh, conclusions already being summarized based on these studies. Now we look at the second part, which is a little bit more difficult than the uh, breath, and that is the emission from our skin or from the whole human body, okay? In order to do that, we need to put a person into a environmental chamber, and then we try to understand the difference between the skin emission and the breast emissions. So we put a gas mask, and so ask the person to wear a gas mask, and the purpose of that is trying to filter out the emissions from the breast and only leave out the skin emissions, okay? So we put the person here and then allow the person to stay there for a couple hours and then get the concentration increase. So we measure that increase curve and then we can calculate the emissions from the skin. Okay. So this part of the work is actually, we just started, we measured 20 subjects so far and including roughly half and half male and fe female subjects. And uh, just show some very preliminary results. Qualitatively, uh, it's not a surprise that also very similar to the breast emissions, you found a lot, a long list 
of these chemicals. And uh, quantitatively, uh, also we found the emission rates from uh, different persons, and we can compare that between the skin emissions and the breast emissions. And uh, so the uh, general conclusion, VOC emission emitted by the skin are different from VOCs emitted by the breast, from the breast. There are something in common, but there are many in difference. And also we found that emitted, uh, e VOC emitted from the skin are mainly high molecular weight compounds. Okay, so these are the results. And uh, the other issue we are looking at is the oxidation reaction uh, inside the cabin. And uh, we did this measurement. Actually, if you look at the literature, there have been a lot of work uh, on the ozone reaction with the human surfaces, with the human, with the tissues, uh, uh, soil, tissues or soil clothing. So uh, based on that information, we know that the reaction really happens between ozone and the, and the skin oil. So we did a little bit more fundamental things, and that is to take out the major ingredients of the skin oil, which are the squalene, palmic acid, and uh, cholesterol. And then we did a separate measurement and try to expose these components into a certain amount of ozone, and then we find out the reaction, okay? So here are the very brief results. We found uh, many, many products, and, uh, and, and, and that can explain, uh, basically can explain the uh, overall reaction between the ozone and the human surface. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, also, we are looking at the emissions from other sources, for example, the carpet, seat, and all these material sources. And I would say these are kind of standard procedure using small chamber or large chamber use GCMS. The only thing unique is this one. This is a low pressure chamber. So you can measure the emissions under low pressure condition, which is happening inside the cabin. Um, so this shows the uh, measuring the uh, emissions from the three seats in the large chamber. Now, I'd like to come to the second part, which is the uh, particles, okay? And uh, before that, we did the measurement of the carbon dioxide in, uh, concentrations because the carbon dioxide, it could be a good indicator of the ventilation in the cabin. So we uh, measured the, uh, that curve, and we found the, uh, you know, the inlet and outlet concentrations are actually, if you look at the range, is roughly inlet is about 500, 600, which is a mixing of the recirculated air and outdoor air. And the uh, cabin concentration is roughly around 1,000, okay? So it's somewhere between 900 to 1,400, which is roughly the same level as what we have in the building, in, like in this room. This room may be a little bit higher than that. And based on the CO2 generation rate and, uh, and CO2 level, we could estimate the outdoor air. We cannot directly measure that. It's very difficult. But we can estimate, and that is around this 5 to 10 liter per second per person. Uh, the FAA requirement is 4, so this has no problem. For CO2, FAA requirement is 5,000, this also has no problem. But remember, FAA requirement is a minimum requirement, okay? So then we try to look at the particle size. So we measure the indoor particles, uh, the cabin particles at different locations. And then we try to understand where do these particles come from. So we look at two potential sources, whether it's from outside, which is a bleed air, or from the inside, which are mainly generated by people. So uh, here it shows the total particle count, okay, at different phases. So you can find a very interesting trend. When the uh, aircraft is close to the ground, when it's parking there, taxiing, the count is high, and when it's during the cruise on the high altitude, then it's relatively low, okay, so that's one trend. Of course, during this process, there is also some turbulence, okay? It could be due to the clouds going through a cloud or could be due to the services, the so the meal that can generate the peak a little bit. So actually, you can put all these flights, we have measured about ten, nine flights and put them together, it shows a very, very similar trend, okay? So that's the, uh, that's, that tells us something, okay? So that means when, when the aircraft is on the, 
on the ground, really, the concentration is much, much higher than with, uh, when it is uh, on cruise. And then we try to do a, a little bit of modeling based on the ventilation rate. And then we show the inlet, outlet particle concentration on this curve, and then we try to get the result like this. So basically, we found that for small particles, 0.3 micron, most of the particles really come from outside, from the bead area. As the particle size gets larger, then the contribution from outside gets smaller, while the contribution from inside gets larger. So that's the, uh, uh, I think this result has been published as well. And then we look at the, try to feel, dig out, again, look at the salt. We know high people could be a particle emission salt. So we put the people into the chamber, but this has to be ventilated, and then we measure the uh, particle generation from people and the different closing condition, different activity levels, okay? And other than being a salt, people minute. could also become a thing. So not only the people, I'm sorry, but also the cabin surfaces like the carpet. And so we are trying also to develop a model to characterize the sink effect, okay? So this shows how the cabin surface could be a, could behave a sink. This shows how the, our human surface could behave a sink. And this shows how the air flow rate, air velocity, could affect the sorption rate of the particles. So this really brings me uh, to a question, okay? So after we have done this, we came up with this kind of idea, and that is we are trying to understand the so-called human environmental in interaction of the air pollutants. So you look at the uh, environment, okay? People are here, cabin is here. So from this point, we are generating VOCs, we are generating particles, we are generating microorganisms, and we are generating CO2. The other way is the cabin can affect people as well through the sink effect, so that's the exposure side. So that's the picture that we keep, we have in mind throughout our research. So just to briefly summarize, uh, the results of our onboard measurements provided with an overview of air quality uh, in the aircraft cabin and a target list of key contaminants. Uh, we found that humans are key contaminant sources in a high density, density environment like the aircraft cabin through the breathing, steam metabolism, and ozone re reactions, and activities such as movement and walking. Humans could also be, become uh, contaminant sinks under certain conditions through breathing and skin or surface deposition. Uh, if we want us some bring home message and about what's the general condition in the aircraft cabin. And here probably are they are them, but may not be that accurate. The major level of pollutants in general are comparable to other indoor environments. PM and VOC levels are low and within the guidelines. CO2 levels are similar or not much higher than those in well-ventilated buildings, and the level has little or no effect on our comfort. Cabin air quality, though, can be better, having said that, because we need to understand, we need to understand the key pollutant source and sink characteristics, and the transmission of infectious disease is a very important part, and we need to develop the tools and the industry best practices to optimize the design and operation. So at the last, I want to acknowledge my research team uh, for this very exciting collaboration, uh, Professor to Professor Sandel, Professor Zhao, they're all from Tsinghua University, and the postdocs and the graduate and undergraduate students who are actively involved in this research. And also want to acknowledge the financial support from the Chinese Ministry of Science and Technology through the National Key Fundamental Research Project, and also from the Boeing Company, especially Dr. Chao Xin Lin from Tsinghua Boeing Joint Research Center and from National Science Foundation of China. So that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Yan. That's uh, a lot of to learn from air cabins. Um, our last uh, keynote lecture will be given by Professor Kim Yong Lee from uh, Seoul National University, uh, Korea.